Welcome to the Virtue Bible Study. How many of you are new here? I would just love to see your hands. Welcome to all of you. And we are so happy that you have joined us today. There are over 700 of you registered for the morning Bible study. And we are jumping for joy. We are. Those of us that have been working and praying and um, anticipating this morning, we are so grateful. Thank you all for coming. And uh, we are expecting God to do mighty things in and through the study of his word this year. So before we begin, let's just commit this time of study, and let's commit ourselves to the Lord. Truly, Jesus, you have no rival. You have no equal. You come to break every chain. You come to set the captives free, to open blind eyes, to heal us. And Lord, we are in desperate need of your touch this morning. There's so many of us that come here today that are desperate, that are hungry, that are seeking. And I pray, Lord, that they would see you today. They would hear your voice, and not just today, but this entire year. You have given us yourself. You did bring heaven down to us. You have promised us eternal life, but more than that, you have given us the words of eternal life. You have given us the very living word of God, and it is that living word that we bank on, that we stand on, and that we trust with not only our eternal life, but our life in this present world. We thank you for this opportunity to study your word. And we give you this time, we give you this year, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's been a little bit of a long break for those of us, hasn't it? That Since last May, that was a long time ago. And here we are finally, we are so excited. And some of us feel like it's the first day of school. Do you feel a little bit like the first day of school? I think we all have a little bit of anxiety. Can we just get that out of the way? We all are excited, but we are, are a little bit anxious as well. You know, um, and I want to welcome you to this Bible study, and I want to welcome you to this church. And I want you to know, if you don't happen to know this already, people always associate Harvest and Greg with evangelism. But let me tell you something that is equally a passion of this church and has built this church for 42 years. And he's not done yet. We believe in discipleship. We believe in the teaching of the Word of God, and we believe that that is what transforms lives. It saves our soul, and then it sets us on a path for all eternity, and we want you to know that we believe, and Greg wholeheartedly endorses the virtue study. He went to a small group on Tuesday night with the couples in the Valor groups, and he got to sit in and hear how this church has impacted the lives of people and how this Bible study has transformed individual lives, families, and the community at large. And this is what we do here at this Bible study. I want you to know that this is a Bible study that comes to you at no charge. It is paid for by this church. Your lessons are handed to you. There is no curriculum fee. There is no enrollment fee, no registration costs. Your children, if you have them in children's ministry, are being cared for by volunteers. Your group leaders are not here because they are paid to be here. They're here because they love the word of God and they love helping other women become disciples in that word. Do you realize that there are over almost, almost 200 volunteers just in this study alone that are making this happen? Let us thank the Lord and thank these volunteers for what they're doing. Praise God for that. It's because the Holy Spirit is at work in our midst. And we are so grateful, aren't we? God has given us his word. But when we come to Bible study, if you're anything like me, it does feel like that first day of school, right? We are a little bit anxious, aren't we? Who are we going to be sitting next to? Who is our leader going to be? What is that teacher going to say? What are these lessons going to be like? Am I going to be up for this? It's all so brand new, and I want you to know that I'm right there with you. Sometimes I'm a little reluctant even to stand up here on the platform. This is not my normal person. You know, some people are just, you know, platform people. I am not a platform person. Believe me, I would not be here would it, had it not been for a great prompting of the Holy Spirit and an encouragement from a team of women and from my husband. 
Um, I, it reminds me of this story that um, there's this wife who came in one Sunday morning to wake her husband up and get him ready for church. And she says, honey, what are you doing asleep? It's Sunday morning. You need to get up and get dressed. And he goes, I'm not going to church. He says, I'll give you two reasons why I'm not going to church. I don't like them and they don't like me. And she says, oh, really? She says, well, I'll give you two reasons why you need to go to church. Number one, you're 42 years old, and it's time that you get up and get ready for church. And number two, you're the pastor. <laughs> and that's how I feel sometimes. It's like the Holy Spirit has to say to me, you better get up and get going. And it's that first 10 minutes of a run that always is the hardest, right? How many of you exercise? Or have exercise once upon a time in your life? <laughs> That's a better question because uh, I, I struggle finding time for that these days. I have to really... Anyway, um, that's that first 10 minutes, right? That first 10 minutes, if you're a runner, that first 10 minutes, that is the hardest. And that is so true. Starting something new, beginning again, for those of us that are coming back, and beginning something that we've never done before, like Bible study, um, is something new, and it's difficult. And there is a struggle. You know, I want to tell you a little story about my granddaughter, Allie. Um, last year, she was in kindergarten, and she did super well. She's, she's seven years old now, and she loved her teacher, and she loved her classmates, and she enjoyed the whole process and just flourished. She was excited for school every day, and, you know, kindergarten is a lot of fun. And then came this year. And of all three of the grandkids, we thought Allie was going to skate right in. She would slot right in, be so comfortable. She was excited. She had her new backpack and her, and her new clothes and her new shoes, and she was really in a good space. Well, after the first couple days of school came the weekend, and, um, and her mom noticed Allie was just a little different. She was coming home from school those first couple days, and she was saying things like, I, I just want to talk to Dad. Where's dad? Can we call dad right now? And mom, I miss you so much. I really miss you, mom. I just want to be with you, mom. And then she said, where's papa? Can we go, can we go upstairs and see papa? And then after a, a couple days, the next Monday came around, that real first full week of school, and she was like, mommy, my, my tummy hurts. And, and my chest hurts, mom. And so Brittany, you know, being a good mother, she thought, well, I'll take her to the doctor, have her checked out, and make sure everything's okay. And sure enough, she checked her out, and everything was just fine. She did not have any physical problem whatsoever. It was what we suspected. It was anxiety. She was starting a new class. First grade was very different than kindergarten. And she didn't have a, a female teacher. She had a male teacher who was very gentle and very kind, but he wasn't the one to bend down and always be giving them hugs like his, her teacher in kindergarten was. And, and she was having some issues. And the teacher even told her that Allie is having some trouble. And she's, she's actually crying sometimes in class. And so he's very sweet and made a concession for her. And he would say, OK, Allie, if you need to, you can go see Miss Winter. Miss Winters, there sort of as a support um, for the kindergartners and for the first graders. And he says, you can go see Miss Winter and sit with her for a little while. And then you can come back to class. So she was frequently going out to have this little time with Miss Winter. And <laughs> Miss Winter was very sweet, but you know, <clears throat> We were praying for her because we knew that she just needed to hang in there. It would get easier. We all know that because we've all been through it. School was rough at times, especially the first couple weeks of school. And um, <clears throat> so we were praying and, and praying with Allie about this. And one day she came home last week and she was so excited. She said, Dad, Dad, guess what? Jesus answered my prayer. And he says, really, Allie, how did he answer your prayer? She goes, I only cried three times today. <laughs> Can you identify with that? I hope you don't leave your group crying. But if you do, we'll be in the foyer along with Miss Winter. We'll sit with you and we'll hug you. We'll reassure you. You're going to be just fine. Like we say to Allie, just keep at it, Allie. It gets easier. Um, it gets easier. That first 10 minutes is hard. And we stand at the base of this gigantic mountain of virtue Bible study this year. And for some of us, you know, we want to get to that summit really fast. We want to arrive, don't we? We want to know that Bible study has changed our lives and understand the Word of God and be able to decipher and figure out what's what and who's who and what it all means. And we want to be changed and transformed. That's the goal of Bible study, to hear God's voice and to apply it to our lives for ourselves. We want to get there and we want to get there now. God's detailed plan for our lives and for the world in general 
life and wisdom and prosperity and peace and stability and, and God fix us, fix all the things that concern us and break our hearts and, and weigh us down. Even now, even in this place this morning, we, we want to do it, but you can't just download it like an app on a smartphone. It's going to take patience. And it's going to be one step after another climbing that mountain. And I don't care if you get up that mountain quickly or if you get up that mountain slowly. Here's something that really, really matters. And you need to write this at the top of your notebooks. And it's one word. And it's patience. Be patient. This Bible study is a means whereby we can tether you to the Word of God. I've walked with the Lord 43 years maybe longer, I'm losing count. But when I was 13, 14 years old, I really began to understand that God, there was a God and he had a plan for my life. But it has taken me a long time to get where I am. And I still need those velvet chains of the Virtue Bible study to hold me to the day by day by day discipline of the word of God. And it tethers me not only to his word, but it tethers me to all of you. And I need it. There are times when I will come on a Thursday morning and I'm sort of dragging down and I see all your faces and all of us collectively as we worship together and as we speak to one another, we encourage and build each other up. I need you. You need me. Let's be tethered together. I want you to develop a hunger and a taste, the sweetness of that honey of the word of God on your own tongue to taste it for yourself, right? Do you want to know the sweetness of the honey of his word for yourself, not just because someone tells you it's sweet, but because you've actually tasted it. Um, So some of you remember uh, this powdered drink called Tang? (laughs) Do any of you still drink Tang? (laughs) It tastes pretty good, doesn't it? Tang was awesome, hey, the astronauts drank Tang, right? Took it to the moon, right? And uh, so it was supposed to be good for us. Well, my little sister, when she would wake up from her naps, That's what my mom would let her drink in her bottle, was Tang. Can you imagine? Nowadays, we'd be like, no! Did you read the label? (laughs) You know, what if before you ate something, uh, uh, how many of you are labeled readers in the grocery store? It's kind of scary sometimes. What if you read on the label, corn syrup solids, partially hydrogenated soybean oil, cassinate, dipotassium phosphate, monodiglyceride, sodium sterol, lactate, soy lecithin, sodium aluminosilicate, and salt. Wow, doesn't that sound just so delicious? And won't that be so good for you? Do you know what that is? No, it's not tang. It's coffee, mate. How many of you love those flavored creamers? It is made of nothing but chemicals and weird stuff. I know it tastes good. I grew up drinking Sanka and Coffee Mate every morning. That's what my mom had. This was the 50s and 60s where all this new technology and all this new processed food was just so new, along with TV dinners and other things like that that are bad for you. Full of preservatives, full of stuff that your body can't even use. Let me tell you, when you see something like that in the grocery store and you read the label and you inform your mind what is in this stuff, you will put that bottle back on the shelf and walk away slowly and go running for the organic vegetable aisle, right? The older we get, hopefully we start reading those ingredients. My little grandson could care less what gummy bears are made out of. He would not care. It tastes good, that's all he is. But let me tell you, the more I read labels, the more my love for non-dairy creamers and fiery hot Cheetos is dying a slow death. It is dying a slow death. I read the label, but for a lot of Christian women, this is really important, okay? Because I know I'm talking to some of you out there. A lot of Christian women, their diets are made up of popular Christian books and blogs they read and their favorite entertaining speaker that they download on a podcast or they read daily devotions like their spiritual horoscope. God did not intend for you to build your spiritual life on pre-digested, pre-prepared, highly preserved stuff that sits on a shelf. He wants to give you fresh manna every day and speak to you directly every day from his word. Okay, you're clapping. That means you agree. That means daily you're going to be in God's word. 
because you don't eat once a week on a Sunday morning. As wonderful as Pastor Greg's sermons are, and as chock full of important information as that is, you cannot retain all of that in a 45-minute message. You need to plant the Word of God deeply into your heart on a daily basis, and even more than on a daily basis. We need to be realigned. How many times a day do you eat? They say, okay, some of us eat once a day. Some of us eat twice a day. Some of us eat three times a day. You know what they're saying now more and more? It's good for us to eat up to five small meals a day. Why? To keep our energy level high, to stabilize our blood sugar. Wouldn't that be true of our spiritual lives as well? If we just kept the Word of God open and we did our lessons and we meditated on the Word of God and when we're tempted to fear or doubt or lose our temper or to panic or whatever, that we would have the Word of God as the stabilizing, blood sugar stabilizing force in our lives. We need a delayed sense of gratification. The Bible is not neatly packaged into 365 daily readings. It is comprehensive, and we need to be able to be so familiar with it that when we are faced with challenges, that God would speak to us through his word himself. Isaiah 28, verse 9 says, To whom will he teach knowledge, and to whom will he explain the message? Those that are weaned from milk, those taken from the breast, for it is precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. Ladies, don't be discouraged. The, the word of God and the understanding of who God is and what he is doing in the world today throughout all of history and in this pinpoint in time in which you and I are existing, we need to get that into our heads. But it doesn't come down out of heaven in a cloud and suddenly we wake up and it's all there. It is slowly building in our lives and building in the lives of those that we are responsible to teach the word of God to. Okay, so I'm going to give you just a few tips for Bible study this year. I'm going to run down these really fast. Before you come to Bible study each week, do your best to understand the chapter that we're studying, the passage that is laid out in your lesson. Before you even begin to go to the questions, I would say you could almost go to those questions at the very end of the week. Begin the first part of the week by just hearing the word of God, reading the passage, download it on an app, listen to it while you're folding the laundry or while you're driving in your car or while you're doing whatever you're doing. If you have a moment of silence, take a bath, turn the app on, listen to that chapter. Let the word of God become so familiar and, and, and then begin to pray. What is God saying here? And how does, this, how does this relate to my life? But begin by listening. And next, get yourself a good Bible. And I mean, a brick and mortar Bible. I know it's really convenient to have them on your iPhone. And that's awesome when you're traveling or you're driving, you can listen. But when you're at home doing your lesson, get yourself a real hands-on Bible that you feel comfortable writing in. Get yourself some colored pencils and highlighters and have fun. My first Bibles, I love to look back at those because there are those treasures and nuggets that God showed to me faithfully over the course of my early Christian walk. And there's little flowers drawn in, a little scrolly lines, and, and I can find certain passages and remember when God spoke to me. So get moved into a real Bible. Use the cross-references. A lot of Bibles have little alphabet letters next to certain words. You can follow those in your Bible in cross-reference. You find Old Testament, New Testament passages that deal with the same topics. Get yourself an English dictionary or download one on your phone. Now, I know a lot of Bible apps have Greek and Hebrew um, dictionaries and lexicons and so forth. And let me just tell you, I do not speak Greek. I do not speak Hebrew. And a lot of times those can get you in some trouble when you're trying to interpret things. Don't, don't try to make it fit. Those translators who translated these scriptures into the English language, they were Greek and Hebrew scholars, and they chose those English words for a reason. Compare different translations, a word might be used slightly differently, and look it up in your English dictionary. It's going to open up windows in your thinking and understanding of the passage. So, okay, those are just some tips. Now, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Nehemiah. Okay. Where is the book of Nehemiah? All right, if you have a Bible that is not like this one, which has a big fat concordance, which is sort of like a dictionary in the back of the book that tells you where to find certain things, but if you have a Bible, it's right about in the middle of your Bible. If you open up your Bible in a half, you will see that you're just about in the book of Psalms, back up a couple books, 
and you will find the book of Nehemiah. All right, it comes at the end of, of uh, First and Second Chronicles. Then you get Nehemiah. Um, what's really interesting to think about is that our Bibles are not arranged in chronological order. Our Bibles are arranged differently than that. But if you were to put Nehemiah in a chronological order, do you know where it should go? At the very back of your Old Testament, right before the New Testament. It's not really in the middle of the history of the nation of Israel. It's at the very, very tail end. And in Nehemiah, we're going to get the last glimpse of Old Testament history, approximately 445 B.C., right before the curtain comes down and the silence of 400 years begins, only to be broken by the sound of angels singing at the birth of the Messiah. Okay, we are looking at the very last smidgen of Old Testament history. This book is historical narrative. It's a factual retelling of real events. And it is the story of God's people who were mercifully and finally returning from exile. And they are returning at a point of desperate need. Nehemiah, obviously, his name means comforted by God. And I pray that we will find the comfort and the strength. The word comfort means with strength, strengthening, that we need this year. At this point in the history of the nation Israel, they are no longer a magnificent kingdom. Last year, if you were with us, around late winter, we finished up our studies in the life of David. And we ended with the glorious Pre preparation that David had made for the building of the temple, the first temple. They had been up to that point in worshiping the Lord and the Ark of the Covenant was in a tabernacle or a tent. But Solomon wanted to build a house for the Lord and he built a glorious temple, beautiful, and it was extravagant and it was gilded and it was amazing, the, bu the building that Solomon built. But that building is not at all what the nation of Israel was going back to build at this time around. Those were the glory days. The nation had largely abandoned God, first the northern tribes and then the southern tribes. And God had warned and warned and warned and warned them that if they forgot him and if they strayed from his commandments and if they worshipped idols, that he would bring judgment upon them. If they didn't hold fast to the word of God, he would send them into captivity. And the prophets, Jeremiah and Isaiah, warned the people, but they didn't listen. They wanted to hear peace and safety, peace and safety. Everything's just fine. And the enemies were gathering at the gates and Babylon conquered Israel. They sacked Jerusalem. They tore it in pieces. They destroyed the temple. They took the treasures of the temple, the gold and goblets and offerings, that, things that were used in the offerings for the sacrifices that were taken away to enrich the coffers of the king of Babylon. The walls were broken down and the people were taken into captivity. And we remember reading that psalm, and oh, you probably even know this song, by the rivers of Babylon. We sat down and wept when we remembered Zion. Zion was the mountain in Jerusalem where God was worshipped. And how can we sing the, the Lord's song in a strange land? They mourned and they wept and they were in captivity for these 70 years. But for Nehemiah, as we will discover in chapter 1, I want you to remember this. For Nehemiah, when he hears that the walls are broken down and the gates are burned with fire and the people are in desperate need, he is weeping, but he's not weeping over the original destruction of those walls. He is weeping because the, the, the exiles had begun to return. Against all odds, pagan kings had begun to allow the people of Israel to go back, starting with Cyrus, which was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 26, long before Cyrus had, long before Nebuchadnezzar had, had conquered Jerusalem and taken them captive, God had given Isaiah 
The name Cyrus, and this is what he says, years and years before the captivity, he says, Jerusalem will be inhabited and the cities of Judah will be built and I will raise up their ruins. When Isaiah was speaking this, Jerusalem wasn't in ruins, but judgment was coming because of the idolatry, but God gave him a promise. And he says, I will raise up their ruins. And he even names him. He says, Cyrus, this pagan king, this idolatrous king will be my shepherd. Isn't that something to think about? That God works. God is enthroned upon the heaven and the heart of the king is in the Lord's hand and he moves it like rivers of water. Remember that. God can move even in pagan kings and this pagan king came on the scene as the ruler and he issued a decree for whatever his reason, whatever his motivation, there's a lot of scholars that debate why he did this, he started to allow the people to go back and he says, the Lord has told me to do this. You can read it in the last chapter of the book of Second Chronicles where Cyrus actually says, I want the exiles to return and to rebuild their city and to worship their God in their city. They started to go back. Hallelujah, rejoicing. People started going back. Nehemiah knew about this. If Nehemiah was about 35 years old when he was serving, and I'm guessing he was probably in the prime of his youth because the king would often pick from the best of the captive slaves to serve like he did with Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They were ones who were wise, they were young, they were skillful in wisdom, they, had, uh, they were beautiful to look at, they were handsome. So here is, here is Nehemiah, knowing the prophecy of Isaiah, knowing that the pagan king Cyrus, before he was alive, had begun to allow waves of exiles to return to Jerusalem. But what he hears is the worst of the news. It's wor almost worse in a sense because the rebuilding had begun when Cyrus issued that decree, but it had been stopped. It had been stopped by the king's governors, subsequent king's governors who were there in this region called the Trans-Euphrates. This is the, the part of the Persian kingdom that was outside, beyond the river Euphrates, in this, um, in this territory called Judea as we know it today. The rebuilding had begun, but this was a new and a fresh disaster because the governors had reported back to the king that the rebuilding is going on. Now, this wasn't Cyrus any longer. This was another king. The building is going on, and these Jews are rebellious. They're a wicked people, and they will not pay tribute. So the king, and this was Artaxerxes, Nehemiah's king, put a halt to the building. Unbeknownst to many of the exiles who were still living in Babylon, there was a sudden stop. The king's order was, no, you can no longer build until he has a chance to think this over. Forgetting the decree issued by Cyrus, they had begun to rebuild, but it had been stopped. And for Nehemiah, this was a disaster that was worse than the original destruction. Why was it worse? Because though the exile had been promised, God's God's plan for the Jews, God's plan to restore all things was going to be thwarted. This was the reality of the chosen people and where they were living in exile. This city was burned with fire. Imagine living in a place where there were no more safe neighborhoods, where all the windows were broken, where there's graffiti everywhere and trash in the streets where there is no police force, there is no courts of justice for those who are being oppressed. And there would be no evidence that God really cared for his people. They were living and they were distressed. And all this had been stopped without a secure wall. And without the temple, the people of God were defenseless. And their faith would be challenged. And that is what Nehemiah hears and he weeps. Nehemiah, though, knew the scriptures. And this is why it's so important to understand the sweep of redemptive history. He knew the scriptures and he knew this is what he knew. Though he was safe in the palace, living a very comfortable lifestyle, he was in distress. Why? Because he knew that unless there was a restoration of Israelite culture and a reestablishment of the kingdom of, G of Israel, there would be no return to the sacrifices. There would be no return to the true worship of Yahweh. There would be no Messiah. Jesus had to grow up. 
in a Jewish culture as a Jewish young man, fulfilling all the requirements of the law. But if there was no temple, these people would intermarry, they would be assimilated, and all of that would be lost into the surrounding cultures. Eventually, God would be forgotten as the people would intermarry with those who are not of the true faith. There would be no more nation, no nation, no promised Messiah. And so the return of the exiles wasn't just your normal homesickness. It wasn't just a longing for home. The return of the exiles would be the key ingredient for God's redemption for the whole world. You see, Nehemiah had kind of what I have right now. I have one contact lens for, for reading and one contact lens for long distance. We need the same thing when we live in this moment in history, ladies. And we look around and we say, wow, we are really on a fast slide downhill. When we see what's happening in the news, it can be very distressing. But listen, we need a long-range view. What do we know? But the, the scriptures say that Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will return. He is coming back again. We know the end of the story. What is our job in this moment in history is to keep that fire burning, keep faith alive, keep hope alive in our individual lives, teaching it to our children and our children's children that God would not be forgotten as we await his second coming. And Nehemiah knew that unless the temple was reestablished and the culture was protected and, and allowed to flourish once again, there would be no Bethlehem. There would be no Messiah. There would be no Calvary. There would be no resurrection from the tomb. And there would be no salvation. Let me wrap up this introduction with just this simple four points. Number one, in the midst of ruins, God's people can live hopefully in the midst of ruins, God's people can live hopefully because God has a plan and we know the long range plan. We are living between Calvary and the second coming. We have salvation that is offered. It is our job to live out that salvation and to tell others about this salvation and wait and hold fast until he comes. We are living in that era. Where are we? We are in an age of grace. God is having mercy on his world. That's why he's waiting, but it is a broken world. And we are calling people to come to reconciliation with God. And as we're reconciled with God, our lives will be reconciled with one another. But as long as there are those who are not reconciled with God, there's going to be war. There's going to be injustice. There's going to be oppression. There's going to be all kinds of stuff, broken families and, and shootings in, in Las Vegas. There's going to be earthquakes and hurricanes. This is a broken world, but God is at work. We have the answer, and we are commissioned to go do something about it. Number two, it only takes a few people, a few people with hearts to begin to pray and a will to work to make a change. You will never know, ladies. We had an event here, and we called it fervent, and, and I believe God was stirring our hearts to pray. He was stirring our hearts to pray. God stirred Nehemiah's heart to pray. Why was that prayer so significant? It took Nehemiah four months from the time he heard about what was happening in Jerusalem until he was able to approach the king and get new, fresh orders from the king. But four months he prayed, and in that four months, Nehemiah didn't know that behind the scenes, letters were flying back and forth from Judea to Susa, the capital, where the, where the exiles were saying, but no, Cyrus issued a decree. We are not a rebellious and wicked um, nation. We are not unfaithful. We are been, we've been given this um, order that we could rebuild, but no, now we have to stop. You need to go back and search for the, the, the original order that Cyrus gave, and sure enough, Behind the scenes, it's not documented, but if you read Ezra, which is a companion piece, which dovetails, you will see behind the scenes these letters going back and forth, back and forth until the king says, search for the order. When he finds the order, then the work goes forward again. Nehemiah prayed. He may have never known in his lifetime until later that 
that this was what was happening as a result of his prayers. You don't know. We need to pray, ladies. Pray and have a will to work. Okay, number three. There are lots of opportunities. And with those opportunities are going to come opposition. We don't know how, we don't know when, we don't know where. But we're going to see how the opposition came to Nehemiah. But let me tell you that just because you know the end of the story, just because you've been reconciled with God, you have the hope of eternal life and meaning and purpose in this world, doesn't mean you're not going to suffer. Somehow there will be opposition. Alan Redpath said this, there is no winning without warfare. There is no opportunity without opposition. There is no victory without vigilance. Whenever God's people say, let us rise and build, the enemy says, let us rise and oppose. The scriptures, if you read it through, and you're not just picking the candy-coated parts that are going to help you get through the day by reading your daily horoscope in some book, but if you really read and study, you will see God's people were very opposed. God's people were oppressed. God's people did suffer. But God triumphs in the end, always. One day the battle will be over. But it's not over yet, so expect opposition. Listen, Nehemiah 4.14 is what I want to tell you today. Do not be afraid. When you turn on the news, when you get that call from the doctor, when your kid walks in or, the, or, or he calls you from jail, When you get that diagnosis, whatever it is, remember the Lord. Do not be afraid. The Lord is great and awesome. Fight for your brothers. Fight for your wives. Fight for your homes is what Nehemiah said. We need to pull up our big girl pants and get busy, ladies. It's time to grow up. If you're old enough to understand the words I'm speaking and to read this Bible for yourselves, it's time to grow up. And number four, last but not least, God has put you exactly where you are. You are not insignificant. You are influential. I don't know how wide your sphere of influence is. It is your job to discover where God has placed you and how influential you can be for him and for the kingdom as we await his coming. You don't have to be powerful culturally or politically to accomplish his purposes. Nehemiah was neither a politician, nor was he popular. He was just a guy doing his job. He was not a builder. He didn't know building codes. He didn't know anything about putting brick and mortar together, and yet he did. He was simply the cupbearer to the king, but God called him. Listen, wherever you are, just realize this, that big doors swing on small hinges. There is no one that's going to tell your kids, tell your family, share with your husband, pray for your friends like you. No one. You are where you are for a reason. Faith and freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We need to be busy to guarantee that our children and our children's children will hear the word of God like we have heard it. We don't pass it on to our children through our bloodstream. It must be fought for. It must be protected. It must be held on to. You must not veer from it, deviate from it, no matter what culture tells you, no matter what the popular culture is telling you is right or wrong. If it's in opposition to the word of God, you hold on to the word of God. This will never fail. Heaven and earth will pass away, we're told, but God's word will never pass away. It is eternal. It is God-breathed. We can bank on it, live it, know it, understand it, and share it with people. And then we need to pray, God, what is your vision for me? Where are you taking me? God's purposes are going to be accomplished. Listen, God's plan is not to be thwarted. And as we will read in the book of Esther, what, her, what Mordecai said to to the queen, he said, listen, God's plan is not going to be thwarted, but who knows that you haven't been put in this place where you are for such a time as this. What is that plan that God has? Are you opening your eyes? Do you see beyond your own little footprint what God is doing? Do you have a bigger vision? Do you have a heart to know what that vision is? 
to be faithful to what it is that God's called you to do. The church is made up of living stones. All of you are part of those living stones. And if one of us fails in our mission, there is going to be a gap in that wall. Now, the Lord ultimately, like I said, his plans will never fail. But we don't want to miss what it is that God has called us to for such a time as this. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we pray that we will all be the willing instruments that you have called us to be. As you called Nehemiah, you call us today. That we can live amongst the ruins with hope and joy. That we can face opposition with our eyes wide open and still not despair. That we can see the places where we are and lay hold of what it is that you have called us to for such a time as this. Bless us this year. May we grow like we've never grown before. Who knows, it may be our last year, our last moment to share truth with our children, with our friends, with our husband, with our coworkers, with our fellow students, wherever you've placed us, this may be our last opportunity. May we not miss it. We ask this now in Jesus' name, amen.